Perfect. So good afternoon. I want to welcome everybody to this session of the Belonging Project webinar series. Um, today, we will have Yulia LaRoe present for us. Um, but before she gets into her presentation for today, I would like to just introduce her to you all. Um, yeah. So Yulia is an experienced attorney, certified coach, seasoned trainer, and legal talent development consultant. Yulia helps law firms and lawyers develop and implement winning strategies in the areas of leadership, management, and business development. She is the founder of an award-winning legal de development consultancy, LeadWise Group. Prior to working with law firms and lawyers, Yulia practiced international law at an AM Law 100 law for nearly 10 years. Oh, sorry about that. As counsel for numerous Fortune 500 companies. Yulia holds a law degree from USC Law School and is a credentialed as a certified professional coach through the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching. She is a certified master practitioner of the Energy Leadership Index Assessment and certified everything DISC. And with that, I will turn this over to you, Yulia. Thank you so much, Whitney. It is such a pleasure to be here, and uh, I will say that uh, one, this project and this firm are very near and dear to my heart because that Fortune uh, M100 law firm uh, is actually Cypress Shaw. So I'm a former uh, alumni, or I guess I am an alumni of the firm, and I'm really excited to be able to be part of this uh, program. I want to thank everyone who's joining us on this Friday afternoon. You know, I'm sure you guys have plenty of other things that you could be doing, and instead you're here learning um, and kind of, you know, taking, uh, taking time to expand and, and uh, focus on your own learning. So I want to share a little bit about the Belonging Project. Um, so the word Ubuntu became popular worldwide during apartheid, as Bishop Desmond Tutu explained, a philosophy in multiple South African ethnic groups that our humanity derives from the humanity of the collective. Ubuntu symbolizes the universal bond we have as a people and the focus on collective responsibility. Just as the pandemic has illustrated how interdependent we all are, and isn't that the truth, this collective is focused on working together to move forward in our shared commitment to improving inclusion and diversity in the legal profession. We believe that we rise and fall together. Built on this concept, the Belonging Project is a collaborative network of professional and personal support for diverse legal talent across industry organizations and law firms. Through the Belonging Project, we're offering opportunities and programs to support diverse law students and lawyers during the pandemic. This initiative will contribute to diversity in the legal profession and encourage others to contribute and leverage their expertise and their resources. In collaboration with our industry partners, we will offer webinars focused on professional and personal development, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and a curated resource center devoted to well-being and professional growth. So fantastic project, project uh, loads of different resources. And part of what I'm going to be presenting on today absolutely falls within professional development and growth uh, category. And today I'm going to be speaking about ways to set boundaries without losing respect of credibility. And the reason why this topic is so important is that over the years, you know, first I've practiced for about 10 years as an attorney myself, and then I've been doing this work for almost a decade as well, nine years to be exact. So over the course of kind of both of these careers that I've had, this is one area where a lot of people struggle. And it's not because it's, you know, it's so obvious and we should just figure it out, but it's actually there's a lot of moving pieces to it. There's mindset component and then there's also strategies. And I'm going to talk about both today. And you'd be surprised the type of people that actually come up with sort of uh, issues or challenges in this area even very senior ones, right? So if you're thinking, well, I'm very junior or I'm a law student, you're not alone. People at a very high levels um, also struggle to set boundaries. So we'll, we'll talk about some ideas of how to help you earlier on in your career. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to kick us off with a story. So imagine a firm and imagine a you know, practice area in that firm. And there are two 
attorneys. Both are you know, experienced, they're successful, they're valued by their colleagues, the clients love them, and they both report to this one partner. Now, one attorney is constantly getting emails from that partner late at night, uh, emails or, you know, calls on, you know, while the attorney's on vacation and expecting immediate response, right? And when, you know, when the attorney doesn't respond, the partner kind of follows up with another email and says, hey, did you get it? What's going on? And you have another attorney also working for the same partner, but is not getting the same treatment doesn't get bombarded by late night emails, doesn't get chased down, you know, where's the response. And if you were to ask the partner why the two lawyers are being treated differently, you, you know, he would say that uh, he, he respects and values them both equally. So why, I guess the question I would like to kick off this conversation with is, why do you think the difference in treatment and if you would like to use the chat uh, uh, box, then go ahead and put in sort of your idea or your thoughts on why, and we're going to come back to the story as we move through this program, but I'd love to hear what you guys, you know, thinking about and whether the story sounds familiar, whether you've seen people in this situation, and frankly, if you found yourself to be in this situation. And uh, I'll, I'll give you... I'll give you a little bit of a sort of a clue, and the people in this in this scenario are both me. <laughs> so, you know, one is earlier on in my career where I had no clue how to set up boundaries, and then later on when I've learned how to do that. And in fact, uh, with the same partner, right? So, I guess I wanted to share that to to say that there is uh, you know light at the end of the tunnel, and we can also absolutely all. Uh, set up boundaries that allow us to be most productive, but also feel respected and cared about. Um, okay, so we've got one comment. People treat us the way we allow them to treat us. One lawyer has taught the partner how to treat him. He, was, he has set boundaries, and he probably gets the work done, so the partner gives him greater latitude. This is perfect, Cherry. Thank you so much. This is exactly the situation, right? So, if you don't set boundaries, you train people how to treat you, whether it's the way you want them to treat you or the, the way you don't want them to treat you. And so that's really what we're going to talk about today. What I would like to, to do before we jump in into sort of the, the main content is go ahead and think about one individual in your career right now, your work. And it could be a partner you're working uh, for, it could be a colleague, it could be, you know, maybe even outside of work, but think of one individual where you feel, uh, you know, that they're crossing the line or, you you know, you feel like you, there's a need for you to set some boundaries with them and keep them in mind. As we're moving through the program today, see if you can start applying some of these concepts to that particular situation, okay? So it becomes a bit more uh, relevant and concrete for you. And of course, as we're moving through, feel free to uh, post your questions in the Q&A section. What I'm going to do is I'm going to check in before we move on to the next section of the program to see if there are any questions and if I can answer them. Okay? And final request. As we go through the strategies today, my earnest request for you is that if there's anything you're here, and then your mind gives you this reaction, nah, I don't know, that would never work for me. All I'm asking is suspend your disbelief, open your mind, and just see. It may, it may be just the thing that you need, right? Because we're so uh, used to kind of trying to make a quick decision about something, and, you know, if your situation is not working for you now, maybe there's a different way that we could try, okay? So with that, I'm going to share my presentation with you guys, okay, and all right, so first and foremost, before, and this is probably obvious, but before we're able to even begin thinking about setting boundaries without losing, you know, respect or credibility, 
we kind of need to have earned that respect or credibility. And so the first, um, the first concept that I'd like to talk about, there we go, is these so-called prerequisites to setting boundaries. And these prerequisites, the first one is to have earned your respect or credibility with the people that you're trying to set boundaries with, right? So, you know, how do we do that? Honestly, simple but not easy, right? It's doing the work well, right, working hard, going extra mile, doing all the things that would really uh, distinguish you and set you up as a, you know, a truly kind of a cons uh, consummate professional. You know, you want to show over time that you're a hard worker, team player, and really you're willing to do what it takes to do your best work. Now, doesn't mean that you should ignore your needs, right? That's, that's something that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, but you really want to demonstrate this over time. And number two is you want to, of course, also have established a good working relationship with this individual that you're trying to set boundaries with, right? They, the two kind of go hand in hand. And while we're not going to spend a lot of sort of specific time talking about these two points, um, if you have any, you know, questions or sort of issues with it, do include it in the Q&A. And, you know, if there are some specifics, yeah, how do I do that? And if I have time, I'll... I'll address those towards the end, um, but you know you want to make sure that you have a strong working relationship with your with your partner or client or colleague. And then the final piece is you want to be clear on your non-negotiables. Now, let's talk a little bit more about what non-negotiables are. And your non-negotiables are your most important priorities in your work life. And these are the things or sort of, you know, the desires or, or uh, values that reflect what you will or will not accept from others and from yourself. Okay, that's an important piece. What will you, will, will, will or will not you accept from others and from yourself? And the big distinction here is that your non-negotiables are not nice to have, right? They're not, well, it would be great if... There's something that uh, you absolutely, I mean, they're the deal breakers, right? So it's must have or must avoid. And knowing what those are for you is such a powerful approach to achieving fulfillment and success in your career. And I will, will say that it's not unusual for me to work with, you know, partners at pretty senior level to help them discover that they actually are not aware of some of their non-negotiables or things that they thought were non-negotiable for them are really not, or they are, but they're not honoring them. Okay. So the earlier you are able to kind of zero in on that, the easier it will be for you to make sure that one, you know, a job or work opportunities are the right ones for you, and also to build boundaries and kind of uh, um, have your needs fulfilled uh, to make sure that you are honoring these non-negotiables. So what are the types of different non-negotiables you can have? And you can see I have a kind of an example of a list here, right? So it really depends on you, your situation, your background, you know, level of experience, maybe where you are in your career. And the other thing, too, is your non-negotiables will change over time, right? They're not static. They're not set in stone. You know, they kind of evolve as your career evolves. So... Now, one really interesting point, and, you know, if you want to take a, um, a snapshot of this, go ahead, but I think this session is being recorded, so we should get that later. So, okay, so the other point, and this is really important, is this. Honoring your non-negotiables may lead to certain consequences, right? There's a cost to honoring your needs. There's a cost to honoring your non-negotiables, and we need to be clear about that, right? And it's true, really, for anything in life. We, you know, when nothing we get that we get, you know, we get is free. So, let me give you a quick example. Let's say uh, you you said, look, you know, not, one one of my non-negotiables is that I have to leave the office at 6 p.m. or before 6 p.m. every day and never work on weekends. Okay. And oftentimes, you know, let's say if you're in litigation or your corporate practice and the deal is on, it's 24-7, right? So it's really, truly not a non-negotiable that you can honor unless you're willing to, you know, disappoint partners you're working with 
or, um, you know, perhaps sacrifice advancement opportunities or even, you know, lose your job. And you might say in this case, mm, that's not, these are not the prices I'm willing to pay, right, to honor my 6 p.m. sort of a cutoff. Here's another example. Let's say one of your non-negotiables is I'll never do anything unethical. And let's say in some hypothetical firm um, you are being asked that. Well, the consequences of you saying I'm not going to do this are the same. You can disappoint people, right? You can miss out advancement opportunities. You can certainly lose your job. But guess what? In this case, you, you probably will say, yeah, I'm willing to take that risk because this is not something that I'm going to put up with, right? It's a strong value of mine. So obviously this is a very dramatic example, right? But I do it on purpose to show you, uh, you know, kind of how it feels to know which one is which. So all, all of this to say is that if it is something you want to have but you're not really willing to pay the price to honor it, chances are it's more of a nice to have rather than must have, rather than a non-negotiable, okay? Um, okay, so what I would love for us to do next is to do this, right? To take, you know, we'll take a couple of minutes, and I'd love for you guys to start thinking about well, what are some of your non-negotiables, right? Maybe you'll identify a couple today. What makes them non-negotiable for you? Why uh, they're so important for you? How you're currently honoring them? And maybe you're not, and that's okay too, right? That just kind of gives us a sense of where we're at. And also, what are the, the costs of honoring these non-negotiables? Uh, I'll give you a, a sort of a quick example of, of, of how this can sound. And, you know, this is probably an example a bit more relevant, you know, prior to March of this year, but nevertheless. So let's say one of your non-negotiables is a short commute to work, which right now it's what, you know, for most of us is a few steps, right? And, you know, what makes it non-negotiable? Well, I want to spend time with my family, right, and not sit in traffic for two hours each way. So that's the reason that's my why for it. And how am I honoring it currently? Um, I'm, you know, I'm not. You know, I'm commuting an hour and a half each way. Or, you know what, I am. I, I have a short commute and it's working out great. And then what are the costs of honoring them? Well, you know, if you're currently or not uh, honoring them, then maybe what you have to do is ask the partner or, you know, your firm to accommodate you and, you know, create sort of more remote working uh, conditions. And the prices to pay is, you know, it can be scary and uncomfortable to be having these conversations uh, with, with, you know, with people who are superior to you because of all of these consequences that we usually sort of assume that would kind of happen, right? Oh, they'll say no, they'll think badly of me, they think I'm not committed, um, they'll kind of, they'll start sending you work, right? So you want to be aware of the fears that come up because a lot of these are fears that are not really grounded, but of course there's some inherent risk. So anytime we go into sort of, you know, asking for what we want, yeah, there are risks, but you know what? <laughs> uh, what's the saying? Uh, those who don't risk don't drink champagne or something like that, right? So we all want to drink champagne and, um, you know, there's some risk involved, but as long as you're aware of it, we can develop a strategy that kind of takes those risks into account, okay? So now, now that we have, you know, assuming that you have earned the respect and credibility, you have good working relationship, and you're clear on what your non-negotiables are and what your needs are, you know, what you were going to be setting those boundaries for in a sense, right? We are ready to talk about some concrete strategies of what these kind of the process of setting boundaries and really what goes into it. And, you know, of course, there are lots of different tips. There's so many different situations and scenarios, but I decided to focus on three today, the three that come up the most often, and also three that impact the most of the sort of dynamics or situations that I see um, attorneys kind of deal with or, or um, struggle with. Now, before I move on, I just want to check in and see if, uh, if there are any other questions so far that I, that I would need to answer before we move on.
I don't believe you have any questions just yet. Not yet. Okay, great. Okay, and, and once again, guys, feel free to uh, to use the Q&A uh, to include your questions if you have any. If you want me to go over something or, you know, a specific scenario or something else. Okay, so the first tip is to be in demand, not on demand. Okay, we now live in an on-demand world, right? There's more and more things and services are available to us whenever we want. There's Netflix, there's Amazon, right? There's groceries that we can buy online. I mean, anything and everything. But this should not apply to you. Because as a lawyer, you want to be in demand, meaning respected and valued, but not on demand, meaning instantly available 24-7. Now, this is interesting because this really becomes an exercise in self-restraint. A lot of attorneys, and again, even very senior ones, will say, well, I, I pride myself on how responsive I am, right? My clients love that I can just, you know, basically, you know, answer to their emails uh, within five minutes after they send it to me. I will say that this is wonderful if you're the kind of person who can sustain that level of responsiveness, right? It's a lot of energy. It's a lot of attention. But be careful because once people get used to you doing that, they will be disappointed if you stop, right, or be surprised or think something is wrong. So, again, the way we train people uh, of, you know, how we react or how we respond is, is becomes their perception of us. So. What I'm noticing, and certainly have been guilty of that, is that most attorneys have their emails open, and I'm going to venture a guess that some of them have them open now and maybe checking them or even responding, kind of half listening. It's fine, no judgment. But just be aware that you're not really being productive, you know, here or there, right? So it's sort of, you know, kind of half present. But the other thing is, if you're immediately responding to things, then it's a huge mistake because not only it's impacting your productivity, right? Because honestly, we think we can multitask. It's a myth. We can only do one thing at a time. And if we do multiple things, we're doing multiple things sort of not well, right? Um, but it's also a surefire way to tell everyone else that, hey, I'm on demand. You can get to me whenever you want. I'm always on. I'm always available. Now, interestingly, many of us think that being really responsive will earn us respect. What happens, and I don't know if you experienced it before, is that instead people start taking it for granted. Right? It's sort of, oh, well, you know, she or he always responded at night, then I'll just send it, because why not? They never said that they don't want to, they just keep responding to it. So here you want to aim for thoughtful responsiveness versus automatic responsiveness, right? So kind of start practicing uh, um, understanding and discerning where there are true emergencies or just sort of need for a more immediate response and where things can wait. And, you know, not every single email and, or phone call will be those. I mean, we know that. Now, the problem you know, that we all have is that there's lots of emails, right? They're quickly up. So there is a temptation to sort of jump on it and kind of respond to things as they come in. Um, you know, use your, use your judgment. But sometimes you may even choose to delay your response a little bit, right? Um, just sort of so that you don't create this kind of sense of constantly on demand. And... Again, you know, sometimes we're trying to impress uh, the, the people that we're responding to, and so we will self-impose extra pressure. So, for example, if you're working on something, and let's say a client sends you an email or a partner or someone else, you can very easily respond and say, acknowledged, received, I will, you know, will respond shortly, or ask, you know, got it, when do you need it by? But what I see a lot is attorneys will say, oh, the client needs it immediately, or the partner needs it immediately, and I'm going to have to work late to get it done. And then when you ask the partner, and say, well, no, that, that could have waited. They just didn't ask, right? So we're going to talk about assumptions in a minute. This is another really big uh, 
uh, piece here. Uh, but, you know, again, exercising good judgment. The bottom line of sort of this point is you want to show everyone that, you know, you're here to work hard, but you also have limits. Because if you're not going to set these limits and communicate them and enforce them, that other people will not do it for you, right? Why would they? Okay, so any questions so far in this section before we move on? So we do have one question. Great. Let's see. How do we manage leaders and partners who work from an on-demand philosophy? As a leader, I find myself in many leadership meetings where leaders essentially advocate for what boils down to an on-demand response. Mm, that's a great, great question. So, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to mince my words and say that uh, you know there are there are very few leaders like that. In fact, there, there are plenty, right? This is the I think this is sort of the uh, if you know former or old school mentality of approaching uh, business and you know law firm life. And there are assumptions that these leaders make about clients needing and wanting this kind of responsiveness. The, the, the reality is clients are people, too, with lives, right, and, you know, child care obligations and hobbies and, and things that they want to do. So I think as a society, we're slowly moving away from that, and that's my, my real honest hope that we do. But one of the things that could really, you know, and, and again, it's hard to move people's um, perceptions fast, right, and certainly it's not going to happen in one conversation because they've had this belief for a long time and it had been reinforced over the years, and many have become successful uh, as a result of that. However, what's the cost, right? So the cost to them is maybe they spend no time with their family, and they were okay with that, but we're not. So it's, you know, it becomes sort of a, the hope I have is that we're constantly having these conversations, and for, for the individual who asked the question, as a leader, you're in a fantastic position to just sort of bring in ideas and thoughts. And for example, now I love this idea of being really responsive, but at the same time, aren't we, you know, setting ourselves up in a, you know, in a way where, you know, their life, life happens, right? Our attorneys want to spend time outside of work. Um, how can we do this sustainably? What about sustainability? And so engaging people in that conversation, sort of not telling them you're wrong, saying, yeah, I love this concept, but what about this? What about that, right? It, puts the question on them. It puts them in, again, sort of a brainstorming uh, position. And you will have some leaders that will shut it down and say, I don't care. I don't care. This is how I've done it. This is the way we do it. This is how we set ourselves apart from others. And this needs to happen. The long-term problem, of course, is that we're going to start losing talent. Because as you know, I'm sure uh, you guys are seeing, I'm certainly seeing it, is younger attorneys are putting up with it less, less, and less. Right. They just they vote with their feet. They go somewhere else. They look for uh, an environment that can support not just work life but whole life experience. And I think that's that's the future. Uh, and and again, I'll I'll, uh, I'll share this at the end. But uh, if anyone wants to have a conversation offline, I'm more than happy. I'll I'll share my contact information to have you know completely complimentary. It's it's. I truly want to support this community and this project. And so if there's certain things that I might be a bit more confidential or like to spend more time, I'll, I'll leave my contact information, email me, we'll set up a call and, and chat about that. So, um, but I hope this is helpful. Great, um, any other questions, Sydney? Uh, no, that was our question. Okay, great. So let's now talk about another Really big point, again, comes up so often, uh, which is why I wanted to spend time on this today. And it is communicate clearly and do not assume. Now, many times, again, I have been there, but many times lawyers will create our own misery. And we do this by not realizing that um, you know, we make assumptions. We make assumptions about other people's expectations of us. Now, just because, you know, a partner is working until 9 p.m. or starts sending out emails, you know, early in the morning, does it mean that partner expects you to do the same thing? Maybe, but maybe not, right? 
If you don't know, if you can't sort of precisely answer this because you know for a fact, not because you assume, not because, well, surely they all want it, right? You don't know this. Um, challenge this assumption, right? First is kind of challenge your beliefs about these dynamics and, and challenge your assumptions as well. Um, a great example, again, from, from my practice, one of the partners I work with a lot is one of those people, and I don't know if you guys come across, but he really didn't need more than like six hours a night of you know, sleep to feel rested. Just very unique, very energetic person. And, and he would be up in the morning, you know, 5 a.m., just sending out emails. So by the time I'm up, let's say it's 7, you know, I get my coffee, I look to my email, and there's 15 emails already from him. What about this? What about this? My heart is racing, right? And this is, again, earlier in my practice, and they go, oh, my God, what? Right, and so I'm starting to answer the emails and rushing and sort of getting ready and running to the office. And by the time the day is done, I'm so exhausted. But then he's still sending emails, right? And so this cycle went on for a while until I actually ended up in an emergency room. Um, I ended up with a muscle spasm that was so bad that it just it wouldn't let go. Anyway, muscle relaxants, painkillers, you know, I was fine. But that was a wake-up call for me where I had to say, I cannot sustain this pace. This is, my health is being impacted. Like, this is no joke, right? This is when you know you're, you're, uh, uh, the issue became an unnegotiable for you. So we had a conversation, and he said, why are you responding to these emails you know, right away? I have no expectation. It works for me. This is just how I work. But then I take, you know, a longer lunch break. I'll go surfing or do something else in between, right? And I remember for the first time thinking, wait, what? Well, why was I doing all this, right? And the reason I was doing it, well, he didn't say, he could have, but I also didn't ask. And, of course, the dynamic, the power dynamics are always scary, right? Because you think, oh, but I'm the subordinate, so I should, you know, I should just sort of keep working and showing, uh-uh. Again, it's, we think that by accommodating and just sort of, pushing and doing everything we can. We're going to earn more respect. In fact, people start taking it for granted, and it just becomes the norm at whether you're happy about it or not. So I recommend <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, taking some of this information we're sharing today, uh, working on your mindset, and being brave enough and courageous enough to step up and have these conversations. Now, let's, um, let's talk about... Okay, so a couple of approaches. Okay, so a couple of approaches that you can use in, to, in order to clarify expectations. Now, one is, which I personally am not a fan of, and I'll explain why. So one approach is you just do things the way you prefer to do them, okay, until either you were told, hey, actually, we want it this way, or you start to feel that there's a disconnect, right? My personal preference, and I'm more on the sort of direct expression side of, of personality styles, is that it's better to address it directly because that way you are in control of this dynamic, okay? On this conversation, you bring it to the table. If you wait until someone is unhappy with you, then you're kind of sort of on the losing end by that point, right? Plus, it's a little bit more passive. It's sort of like you're avoiding something uncomfortable. Um, so I personally don't recommend it. However, it is an option. Um, in my opinion and my practice and experience, it's better to be direct and ask for clarification. So you'll see that uh, I kind of offered some examples, right, of kind of specific language. And that's because so many times when I'm working with uh, my lawyer clients will say, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that would be great, but gosh, what do I say? How do I say that? And often if they don't have sort of an immediate clarity, they go, I just mm, I don't want to deal with it, right? It's uncomfortable. Get it? I've been there. There's plenty of uncomfortable and difficult conversations, you know, we'll have to have, and it's one of them. However, it can really make a huge difference to your you know, day-to-day -day life. So I say, they're worth it. So here's a long example, right? Um, you know, I hope by now, and again, established, right, good relationship, you've been there. I know, I mean, you know that I'm really committed to the firm and see myself there long, long term. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about some specific things you would like to see from me, right, so your expectations. 
but I also want to share some of my uh, references or things that are important to me. And I have a few questions, right? So here, the reason you want to start with questions first is that you want to, you know, focus on them first. Like, what's important to you? What are your expectations of me? And really, the, the sort of the setup for it, I want to make sure we have a really good working relationship here, right? I want to make sure that I delivered the highest standard. And I continue to do so and that we have no misunderstandings down the line. Right? So oftentimes this year as well, if they, I, you know, even ask how late do I need to stay, they'll think I'm not committed. That's a, that's a mindset, right? That's a fear, right? We would just, you know, and if somebody does think that, well, maybe that's a long-term decision of whether you want to work with someone like that. Okay, so those costs, right? Uh, a cost of honoring your non-negotiables. But, you know, it could be a question like, you know, would you like me to give you any periodic status updates on matters that I'm currently working on? If so, how frequently? If so, in what form, right? Email, call, documents, you know, what, what is this maybe it's chart that we're updating? What is it, what do you want it to look like? Um, so one of, uh, one of the attorneys I was working with said she drove herself, we're laughing afterwards, drove herself crazy because, um, she would submit a daily update to her partner on sort of litigation cases that she was man managing, you know, that were his clients. And at some point she said, it was just so tedious and it was so time consuming and I was so frustrated with it. So I, you know, came to his office one day and said, oh, look, I'm, I'm so sorry. It's just, I, you know, it's so busy. And, you know, the status updates, they're just, I, I can't do this anymore. And, you know, can I do this weekly? And he said, yeah, I don't know why you were doing them, you know, every day. I mean, it's great. I, I trust me, didn't, you know, I'm not complaining, but you certainly don't have to. You know, half of the time, I'm not even reading them. So imagine her kind of, what? <laughs> really, you know, feeling frustrated. But that's a really good example of kind of, you know, creating extra work for yourself, thinking that you're going to sort of go the extra mile, and that's going to impress people. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they go, okay, great, you know, that's fine, no big deal. Uh, another example of a question that you will, you can ask, and again, these, are, these come up a lot, that's why I kind of put them in. If I get an email from you without specific deadline, can I assume it's something that can wait until the next day? Right, oftentimes we go, ooh, the email comes in at 5 p.m., I gotta respond to it. If they don't say it, is it now? Is it now response or is it tomorrow response? Also, uh, kind of similar to this, but generally, if you get an email from a client or a partner, don't assume it's immediate. It's just there's really no need for that. Oftentimes, a simple "sounds great," "how soon do you need it?" and you'd be surprised that oftentimes their deadline is much further out than yours. You, you know, maybe you're thinking, oh, you know, I'll get it tomorrow. I'll say, oh, end of the week or early next week, right? There's absolutely no need for you to try to impress people by pushing when you really don't need to. There will be plenty of opportunities when you have to, and that's when you want to use your um, kind of your time and your energy, right? So you want to be thoughtful about it. Uh, another uh, you know, issue or uh, situation that comes up a lot is child care obligations, right? The parents in the, on the call, uh, it's, it's, it's major, it's big. I mean, oftentimes you're not able to just not pick up your child or right? not have the, you know, the, now it's a lot of online learning, but, you know, whatever the plan is, it's not like you can outsource it. So, you know, something like this, again, there's a lot of fear, especially, I think, for female um, attorneys of, gosh, you know, if I ask this question, they'll not think I'm not committed. I'm really hoping that we're, you know, making a big turn for the better in the industry, and this is no longer something that can disqualify somebody talented from, you know, being successful at the firm. But if it is, and you're really seeing signs of it, Trust me, uh, it, it's not going to get better, right? So maybe signs of something bigger that's going on in that firm, and that's that's another kind of um, opportunity to evaluate. But you know, it, emphasizing your commitment to the work, commitment to support the partner and the clients and your colleagues, and yet being clear: this is important to me. This is what I need to do in order to you know to live my life and 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 to also in order to be successful at the firm. 
are you okay with it? Because if they're not, you need them to tell you. Chances are, even if they're not, they're not going to tell you. But they have been put on notice. And, you know, you can't really go after somebody and say, well, I just don't think they're very committed. They leave, you know, they stop working at four every day. Well, you know why, right? And then they're back online, let's say, at 8 o'clock, you know. So all of these are really important questions you want to ask. And this also gives you an opportunity to share through sort of asking these questions, right, you're noticing that you're asking the question about their expectations, but really you're framing the questions around things that are important to you. So, you know, this is, this is you setting your boundary. That's exactly what's happening. Um, okay, so again, I know that for many of you, just even thinking about these conversations will make you feel anxious or uncomfortable. Again, I've been there, I've been sitting, you know, sort of running through the you know, conversations in my head in my office and dreading it. And I will tell you that every time I've had it, I felt great. And my sort of work and life dynamic had improved dramatically. So, you know, oftentimes it's just sort of coaching yourself through that fear and discomfort. And, you know, you want to frame it, and this is a good, uh, you know, in any kind of difficult or critical conversation, you want to frame it from a perspective of, I'm not, this is not coming, you know, for me, this sort of me being selfish, I'm looking at it, how can I create a better working environment and dynamic for us, right? And that's why I'm, I'm doing that. And ultimately, you always have a choice, right? So sometimes I hear from from attorneys or you know, professionals, well, it's, you know, I really don't have a choice or it's not up to me. You, we do have a choice. We might not like that choice. We might not be willing to take that, you know, make that choice, but we do have it. Um, so not forgetting nobody's a victim here, right? We are, you know, kind of in charge or at least to a certain extent in control of our destiny. So just remembering that um, you're making assumptions, not being direct, um, you know, not clarifying expectations, you might be creating your own misery, and that's entirely unnecessary. Okay, so that's it for this section. And uh, Whitney, do we have any questions here that might have come up? We do. We have a few questions. So the first one is kind of a two-pronged question. What is an example of how you might frame an ask when it relates to, A, you wanting to be engaged in your religious activities, or B, ones related to your health and where you do not want to disclose your, your religion or your health care needs. Okay. Okay, great. So, first of all, again, I really love the questions that are coming in. Very thoughtful, and obviously these are real situations that are happening that we're struggling with, right? Just the point I made earlier where, you know, we always want to frame it from we, right? So, you know, love working at the firm, really committed, see myself here long term or whatever, you know, maybe it's in-house. Um, and so th there are things in my life that I would like to, you know, the devote more time to. And so here's what would be really great if we could do or accommodate you know, is that going to work? How would that work for you? What do you think? What do you, how do you feel about that, right? So it really, I think the, the exact languaging really depends on your relationship with that individual, right? If it's very formal, uh, there's not a lot of sort of uh, goodwill or buy-in, you know, between the two of you, might be a little bit more, I wouldn't say it's more, it's just a bit more uncomfortable because you don't know what their reaction will be. If you know them a little bit more and you build up some of that good rapport and sort of credibility, it might be a lot easier because at the end of the day, as long as you are doing the work, right, and, you know, again, you want to emphasize that, of course, client obligations, my work, you know, I will arrange my days in a way that will I will be able to do that, right? I'm not going to sacrifice the quality of the work. Um, but it is important to me and, you know, I would like to make things work and so that I can, you know, be here long term. So I hope that that answers it. I, you know, and again, uh, as I mentioned, I'll share my contact info if, you know, for the person who asked, if you want to talk a little bit more kind of in private, I'm more than happy to dive into it. And that way you could share a little bit more about the, you know, individual, the kind of the relationship you have with them so we can craft something specific for that. 
Okay, and we have one more. Mm -hmm. How do you handle being on at all times because they know you have access to email and Wi-Fi? So even if you try to carve out X amount of time to be unavailable um, and then get back to work, leaders bypass that and still try to get access to you. Yeah. They love it, don't they? They go, ooh, remote working 24-7. <laughs> no, no. So, okay, let's – a couple of things here. Number one is when, when, you know, when we say, well, it's still trying to get to us, well, they can't physically get to us. I mean, thanks, you know, coronavirus, right? So they can only get to us through email or phone calls, and, and we really – you know, they gain access to us through that if we respond to them. Uh, I mean, you know, if we're sort of unavailable during the times when we're expected to work, that might be an issue. But if it is sort of earlier in the morning or later, you know, in the evening or in the weekend, this is exactly and it's the perfect question for this, for this uh, conversation because this is how we've trained them. We've trained them that if they send us enough emails, if they make, you know, give us enough uh, of the calls, we will answer, right, ignoring sort of our obligations outside of work. If it is, you know, if it's sort of the whole firm is doing that, that's firm's culture. If it's a few people, this is a great opportunity for a conversation. Hey, I want to make sure I am, you know, as productive and as supportive and responsive as I can be. I'm human. You know, I do have a family. And the other thing, too, is if you don't have kids, that's okay, because oftentimes it's like, well, you know, she or he are single, so ta-da, why aren't you working? Um, or, you know, just don't have children or family obligations. You don't have to have an excuse to, to want to have a life outside of work. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe you're working on a side hustle, right? But number one is check with yourself. Are you responding to the emails and calls because you know that these people or this person said, I expect you to? or because they're sending them to you and you think, you, you know, you should because that's their expectation, but you really are assuming because you don't know for a fact, okay? And if you find yourself that you might be assuming, awesome, because now you're in a position to have a conversation about it and say, hey, you know how we'll work from home now. You know how, yes, we're connected, but, you know, there's other things that are going on in life that I'd like to spend my, my time on. What, like, how do you feel when you send me an email, you know, this time or that time, do you expect me to get back to you? I'd like to figure out a way where, you know, I could have time to recharge and, and be, you know, so that I can be more effective and productive at work the next day or just for the long haul, right? If you're hearing this, you might say, oh, that's never going to work, you know, they'll just throw their eyes and that's the mindset issue that I was talking about earlier, right? So we've got to stay open. We've got to try something that we haven't tried before because the alternative is lots of emails and phone calls when you don't want them. I hope this is helpful. And, again, I'm happy to talk offline about this more specifically and so might come up with something more concrete. Okay, super. So we've got one last point that I wanted to talk about today, and you guys might – laugh because it's so obvious and yet kind of difficult to do for a lot of lawyers, which is to take a vacation and truly vacate, right? Um, so many times as a lawyer, and again, done, been there, done that, right, guilty as charged, is you go on vacation and then you start answering emails and then you answer a few more, and it turns into a working vacation, and then it just turns into work. Well, what's the point, right? Again, having, you know, giving yourself sort of a little R&R &R is really powerful for improving your motivation, your productivity, your creativity. So it really is, you know, you're doing a big favor to your, uh, your partner, your firm, right, your, your, your clients, your colleagues in the long run, when you take care of your needs. Now, we're not robots. We need rest and relaxation and things that recharge and kind of revitalize us. Well-being in the law has been a big issue that's been, that's been spoken a lot about, and for a reason, right? Because, yes, there are expectations that sort of some people are bringing from the previous decades of sort of just, you know, this is how we are. 
but life has changed. You know, I mean, you know, women don't stay at home with, with children as much and, you know, work, and men don't have the ability to sort of just kind of dump, you know, child care and everything, life obligations on their on their spouses. So, you know, we're all in this together, and we also need to make sure that we're able to take care of ourselves. So, um, yeah, so the, the point here, life is short. You need time to relax and recharge. Be sure that you take it now. The hardest part about it is letting go, right? And this is, this is tough for attorneys. And, again, it's sort of this mindset, well, I want to be seen as somebody who's really committed, who is there, who is responsive. I mean, I'll do anything I need to do. Think about what type of um, example you're setting and what kind of, kind of, you know, habit you're getting other people uh, in, in sort of in your interactions with, with you. You get used to it and then it becomes the normal. Precedent, that's the word I was looking for, the kind of precedent you're setting. Uh, and, you know, a lot of us feel like we need to be indispensable, but honestly, nobody's truly indispensable, and neither do you want to be. See? Because then you're kind of stuck in the same spot, right? There's not a lot of sort of movement, and, you know, perhaps promotion or things like that. So one thing I will say is really important is any time you plan to take a vacation, number one is tell people. I can't tell you how many attorneys don't tell anyone that they're going on vacation. So, oh, God, I can't remember. And, you know, tell the clients. <laughs> well, you know, maybe they'll tell sort of people they work with immediately, but it's, well, I'm, I'm still going to be checking my email. I'm still going to be available, right? Sort of, you know, God forbid they'll, they'll think I'm human and I need some, some rest. I'm not. I'm not human, right? Um, so tell people you're going and line up support, to, you know, as much as you can. So are there colleagues that, can take over certain sort of to watch, you know, certain cases. Tell your assistant, hey, if email comes in on this, can you forward it to so-and-so to, 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 for them to see, you know, if it's urgent and needs to tell the client, tell the partner. And, and again, if you end up finding yourself in a, in a dynamic where, you know, a lot of people around you just completely ignore it and not respect your, your needs, um, that's a long-term career decision that you have to make for yourself. Where do you want to work? You know, this is a place for you, then great. And if it's not, then it's up to you. As scary as it sounds, you know, especially now. So bottom line of our today's conversation is, and this is my contact info here, is setting boundaries as uncomfortable and scary as it can sound and it can take time to sort of, you know, be, become more comfortable. It's one of the most powerful uh, professional skills that you can develop, and you can learn to do that. And the more you do that, the more you enforce your boundaries, the more successful and more comfortable you become. Now, one point is if you set a boundary and then yourself are not honoring it, nobody else is going to honor it. If you're not enforcing it with other people, then over time it sort of, you know, your statement kind of loses uh, importance and significance, right? So boundaries stay in place only if we enforce them. Now, I'm just thinking of one of my attorney clients um, where, you know, his partner in Australia who had this client who was just wonderful client but very needy, and you know, some some people are and would be, it was easier for her to just send him an email and ask every single tiny little question. And so, yeah, it might be great. You think, okay, she, you know, a lot of access to him, you know, he's billing the time, but it really it wasn't productive because there were sort of random little questions, something that he, she could have easily found out herself. And, you know, and initially we were working on this issue and said, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to have a conversation with her and want to be supportive, but this is out of control. I mean, it was like, 20 emails just from one person a day. It was crazy. But every time he would sort of try to talk to her, he would sort of sugarcoat it, make it very mild, did not come up really with a good approach, uh, and then really not enforce it himself when, you know, she would, again, email him with 50 questions. So um, there was some work for us to do on that front. But um, challenge yourself to think beyond the initial 
anxiety or fear or discomfort that comes up when you're thinking about setting boundaries. Be thoughtful about it. Try to think of how to get the individual's buy-in to sort of the solution you're proposing, right? Hey, this is for us. I want to make sure I'm able to do your work even better. Uh, something like that. And go for it. I guarantee you, you will regret not doing it. You might feel, you know, frustrated and resentful. And if you do, you might gain in the process. I am delighted to have been able to share a little bit of my strategies and, and experience with you here. Again, I'm delighted to be part of this wonderful project. As I mentioned, here's my contact information. Shoot me an email and we can uh, uh, set up some time to chat. And uh, thanks again to uh, Whitney, to Corey, Sin, to Michael, the team, uh, for doing such a great job supporting this, uh, this program. And thank you, Yulia. Pleasure. And thank you for attending today's webinar um, to everyone who is on the line still. Um, if you want to join us next week, we will also have a webinar next Wednesday and next Friday at the same time, 2 p.m. Central. So thanks again, and happy Friday. Bye, everyone.